I mean, it's time to have church. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm excited to be here this morning to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know you are too also. Let's stand. We'll go before his presence. We'll give thanks and give praise to the Lord. This is the Lord's Day Sunday morning. Let's worship God in the beauty of holiness, in spirit and in truth, from the sincerity of our heart. Let's give thanks to our God. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to come, to worship you, to praise you, to give you glory, to give you honor and praise this morning, God. We love you so much, and we're so thankful for all that you will do and all that you have done in our life. Bless this service. Accomplish your will. Draw us closer to you as we worship and praise you and honor you. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. We'll sing that song. He set me free. He set me free. And it will be projected up here. So let's sing joyfully as unto the Lord. He set me free. every chain. Jesus, we are so thankful for freedom. We celebrate this freedom that you have brought to our life. Bless and accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Let's sing about victory in Jesus, 240. Victory in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life.
God, that we can celebrate victory in Jesus. Father, we love you. We worship you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We thank you, God, for all that you have done. We love you so much with all our hearts. And we're so thankful for this time to come and to worship you, to praise you, to give you glory and honor and thanksgiving. Praises belong to you. Honor belongs to you, Lord Jesus. We magnify your holy name. We lift up the name of Jesus. Let God be exalted this morning. Let Christ be exalted. We're not here to promote a man. We're not here to promote anything else. We're here to lift up Jesus. He is the center of our life. He is the focal point of our faith. He is our everything. He is, as the Bible said, He is the way, the truth, the life. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible said when He rose from the dead, He ascended up far above all principality and power and all dominion and thrones and everything else. And God gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow and every tongue tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm so thankful that we serve the great and mighty God. We love you, Lord, and we praise that holy name. We praise and lift up that mighty name of Jesus, the name that is above every name. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated this morning. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning, worshiping and praising God. Aren't you glad that you know who the boss is? You know who who the Lord is, right? There's a lot of confusion in the world, but I'm glad that God made it plain that Jesus Christ is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I love the part of the song where he says, Then I repented of my sins, and I won the victory. We were singing about victory in Jesus. And and that's the reason, that's how we can rejoice this morning, is because we have genuinely from our heart, from our mind, with everything within us, not just simply saying a little prayer, but we sincerely repented of our sins. Right? And we repented of our sins, and then God come in, and He lived in a very clean and pure heart, and then we can shout victory because we made it right with God. Right, and we're we're on the right side, not the left. We're on the right side. We lean right, <laughs> right. We're we're so right. We're so oh, so much on the right as one man say. So you're so conservative. You go order chicken, all you get is the right wings. <laughs> you don't you don't mess with the left wing. You just want the right wing. <laughs> you're super conservative, right? <laughs> but it's good to be on the right side. The winning side, Jesus' side. He's win in the end. You read the book of Revelation, chapter 20. He said the devil was taken and cast alive into the lake of fire where the false prophet and the beast is. And he says, so they will be there forever and ever tormented. And then you read on. He said there are thrones. And he said you see all the saints and Jesus and those sitting upon the throne ruling and reigning with Christ forever and ever. So when you read the end of the book, we win. Right? We win. The Christians are the winner. This life is not what it's all about. This life, and that's the reason why Jesus said, don't lay up treasures upon this earth where moth and where rust will corrupt and where thieves will break through and steal. He said, but rather lay up treasure in heaven. Right? Lay up treasure in heaven where the thief can't enter there. And so, you know, a lot of times today, Christianity, they want to focus on this life, your best life now. Get everything you can in this life. And God will give you that. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He said, all these things will be added unto you. But I'm not living my best life now. My best life is the life to come. Amen. When I walk on the streets of gold and live in my mansion and rule and reign with Jesus and live eternally without pain and sickness and sorrow, living in the presence of God in the light of glory where he said, no man can approach, only those that have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so... Thank you, Jesus, for a hope that goes beyond this life. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. She's going to, um, well, <laughs> we're going to receive the offering first, and she's going <laughs> to sing a song for us this morning. Um, Jimmy, help us out this morning, would you please? And all Christians do pay their tithe and give the offerings unto the Lord, and we thank you for your faithful support to God's work. Would you please pray, sir? Father, we ask you to bless this part of the service. Bless each one according to their giving. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 And thank you all for all of you that joined us worshiping Jesus with us online. Thank you for being a part of the worship service this morning. And uh, there's always a link there you can give and support God's work, so feel free to do so. God will bless you. 
She's going to sing us a song before I preach the word of God. Rise! 
Father, thank you so much, Lord. We worship you. Hallelujah. Praises be to your name, Lord. Yes, God's presence this early in the morning. It's a blessing just to know that God is here with us, and He's testifying to the to the song, "Oh, glorious day!" He's coming back. He's coming back one day. We see now. We don't know when, and it could very well be today, or it could be when you least expect it. So, what's the exhortation in all that? Just be ready. <laughs> just be ready, right? Let's be ready. When you say, well, I, I acknowledge that Jesus died for my sins, and, and uh, I, I, I know that he died and he rose again from the dead for my sins. Does that mean I'm okay, I'm good, I'm good to go? No, 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 that's not what salvation is about. Salvation is, just, is not just a mere acknowledgement that Jesus died and rose again from, from the dead for your sins. Salvation is you have to repent of your sins. And all, the Bible said, all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. That means from the time we were born into this world, we were born sinners. Yeah, that's even my little daughter right there. She is a sinner. She ain't saved. Now, if the rapture takes place, she'll go because she's young and, and she's, you know, she's not of age yet. She knows what she's doing, but <laughs> I think God will give her a break. <laughs> but um, if you're accountable, if you are of age and you know what's right and wrong, then God expects you to do what's right. And so salvation is not just a mere acknowledging, well, I said a prayer, Jesus come into my heart and save me. No, salvation is truly you have to repent. That's what Jesus preached. He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And what repentance is, repentance means change. It means change. You have to first come clean with God. God, I am a sinner. I want you to come into my life. I want you to forgive me of my sins. And then you have to genuinely you know, pursue the Lord and let God change you from the inside out, right? That's what salvation is. If not, everybody will go to heaven. But the Bible said many are called, but few chosen. And the chosen few are those who are willing to do things right. Amen? Amen. I want to make that clear. <laughs> Always. If I have to do, I know you all, most of you are saved, probably all of you are, I don't know. I hope, I will pray and hope. Hey, you never know. I pastor a lady for like five years, I think it was, in Nashville. And then one day God really, really impressed upon my heart. I was coming back from a funeral service, actually. I think I preached a funeral service. And we're coming back, and um, God really impressed my, upon my heart to go talk to her. She was sick. And I went, and I spoke to her, talked to her. I said, let me ask you a question. We've been coming so long. She loved worshiping God. As a matter of fact, I thought about that person this very morning, you know. And I said, are you, have you allowed, have you accepted Christ into your life? Have you allowed, you know, repented, allowed Jesus to come into your life? And, you know, she said no after so many years of being in church. And that's just under my ministry. She'd been on the other ministry for many years. And she had never, never repented and accepted Christ into her life. And I pleaded with her and she said, I just can't. 
I just can't. I went back another time, pleaded with her again. She said, I'm not ready yet. I can't. And it wasn't long after that, she died. She died. I don't know if she ever repented or not, but she died. And so you never know. And that's the reason why as a preacher, I never take anything for granted. I always encourage every one of us, including myself, be ready. Be right. You can't stand before God and give an excuse. If you've been in this church, we will tell you, you need to be born again. Amen? Amen. And you need to be right. And we love you. And that's the reason why we tell you. We love you so much. And so this morning, I want to read to you from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 24. So here we're going to do a lot of Bible reading this morning. Um, verse 11, he said, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with righteous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. And he began to be in want, or he was lacking. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's house have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said unto his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoe on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again, and was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. I want to use verse 15. I know I read it fast because a lot of verses. We'll get back to it eventually. Verse 17, he said, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's house, or of my father's, have bread enough, to, bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? And I want to use that part of the verse there where he said, and when he came to himself. When he came to himself, I would help with the Lord this morning. I want to preach in a message entitled, Turning Point. Turning Point. Let's look to God in prayer. Marvin, would you please pray this morning? Father, thank you for our pastor. Father, thank you for each soul that's present. Father, give us a receiving heart this morning. Father, let us take this message and apply it to our life. Do which is pleasing to your sight. Father, bless the message and the messenger in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. I want to preach about turning point, and I feel a little bit dizzy this morning. <laughs> I'm holding on to the pulpit. Um, just to let you all know, not, nothing to be ca uh, cautious about or, or scared about. We just had a little cold since last week, I think. Not COVID. Okay, I said cold. Yeah. I can smell. I can taste. But, you know, we're just trying to get over it. And that's the reason why I haven't come by and shake anybody's hand or anything like that. You all know what cold is, right? This is the thing before COVID. You don't hear about that too often. You don't hear about sinuses and allergies and anything anymore. All you hear about is COVID. But this is cold. So um, my voice is very, <clears throat> very, it's kind of, you know, troubling right now. But I'll try to preach. And so <laughs> I was standing here praying. I was going like that. <laughs> A little bit dizzy. I'm highly medicated. <laughs> I saw, a, I saw a deal where Joe Biden was listening to this summit speech and he started falling asleep. 
<laughs> so if I, if, if I start falling asleep, you know what, what's going on, right? <laughs> Highly medicated. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I want to preach about turning point. And, um, you know, a turning point is a time at which a decisive change in a situation occurs, especially one with benefit or it's beneficial for us. Uh, sometimes it may take an event of some sort to trigger a turning point in someone's life. And other times it may be just a, a desire of someone's heart. And, you know, sometimes maybe a, a death in the family may cause people to really wake up. And, and they begin to examine their life and say, you know what, uh, man, this thing is real. I just really need to make sure that my life is right when I'm ready to go. And that triggers a turning point and they begin to make steps to start, start changing their life. Or it could be someone just gets sick and tired of the way things are in their life. They're not happy with, the, with, the, you know, with their life the way it is. And they say, you know what, I really need a change. I really need to start making some changes in my life to, to improve uh, my situation. Maybe they're tired of uh, all their finances just slipping through their fingers. They work hard. They bring all their money home. And by the, <laughs> by the end of the month, everybody else gets it. And they have nothing to show for it. And, and so they say, you know what, I need to make some adjustments. I need to make a budget. I need to start um, tracking my finances. That's a really wonderful thing to do. Amen. To track your finances. You know, my pastor, Pastor Davis, taught me that in Bible school about 20-something years ago. About tracking everything you spend. You know, I still practice it until this day. I have a ledger of everything I spend. And except if I spend cash. You know, I don't really track that too much. But everything I spend with a card, everything that comes out of my bank account, that is. So if I take cash out of my bank account, I record it. And that's how I know if somebody's trying to steal my, my credit card. And that's how I know when someone in the family comes and says, Hey, can we do this? No, not, not this month. Uh, let's just hold back. Things are not looking too good. And so, life lesson, you say, I'm a Christian. I got faith. That's great. <laughs> faith don't pay the bills. <laughs> Right, so God gave us a com- God gave us common sense, and He gave us um, a brain, so we can think. And so, even in your finances or whatever part of your life you see that you're not uh, doing well, and you desire a change, and that can be considered a turning point in your life. When you look at your life and said, "I will change my situation. I will change everything that's going on in my life. I will make decisions that are good for me. I will make decisions that will benefit my life. I will do things that will, that will definitely show a change in my behavior. And so a turning point really is a step in the right direction. It is the beginning of something better. It is the reviving of hope for a new start. A turning point is when we make up in our mind uh, that we have had enough and we are ready for a change. A turning point is a very good thing. It is a very needful thing in our life. Uh, And most people that are conscientious about their lives want to do better. Most people that are conscientious about their life want to be better. How many of you want to be better this morning? I know you do. Every one of us, we're not, and that's the reason why we make changes in our life. We want to be better. Well, a turning point is that moment when you make that decision. I want to be better. A turning point for a sinner is when they realize, you know what? I've been living in sin for too long. You see, who is a sinner? A sinner is someone who commits sin, right? If, you're, if you commit a sin, you are a sinner. If you lie, you are a sinner. That lying is a sin. If you steal, you're a sinner. You say, well, I'm a Christian, and, and I sin. Then you need to make it right, right? You need to repent and make it right. The blood of Jesus, let me explain to you something about the way this thing works. Because Christians, so many Christians seem to misunderstand salvation. The Bible said this in the book of Hebrews. You can read it for yourself. Hebrews chapter 10, I think it is, or 11. He said, if we sin willfully... There remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but, I'm quoting this now out of my head, okay, but a certain fearful looking forward of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversary. What that means is that as a Christian, God provided a sacrifice for a sin. How many of you know who that sacrifice is? Jesus, right? 
So he is that sacrifice for his sin. We have an altar, which is the cross. God provided a sacrifice for his sin. And he said that sacrifice covers us when we repent and make things right. He said, now if we sin willfully after we have received that sacrifice, we are not covered. We're not covered. We need to go back to the cross and repent of their sins, just like they did under the Old Testament when they brought a sin sacrifice or a sin offering. They offered that animal sacrifice. They are covered for the sins that they committed until that point. When they sin after that, do you know what they have to do? They have to go and get another animal and bring it to the temple and offer that animal sacrifice to cover them for that sin. And so, same way it is with Christians today. And a lot of Christians misunderstand this because preachers do tell them all they need to do is to pray a simple prayer and you're good for life. No, you're not. No, you're not. That prayer covers you for the sin that you commit to that point. If we sin after that, we need to make it right. And so if you're living with someone you're not married with, that is considered fornication. It is a great sin in the sight of God. Of all the sins that the Bible describes, fornication is one of the ones the, one the Lord really despises. Because that's when you're sinning against your body, which is supposed to be the temple of the Holy Ghost. Which is supposed to be the place in where the Spirit of God dwells in and the Holy Spirit dwells in. So if you are sleeping around outside of marriage, you are wrong in the sight of God. And you need to repent and make that right. And God does not overlook that. Right? And so a turning point is that place where you get to your life and say, you know what? Now that I know the truth of the Bible, now that I know what God expects of my life, I will change. That's what a turning point is. Now that you know what the Bible requires of you, I will change and make it right and I will not Go back and do it. If I do it, then I'm wrong in the sight of God and I need to make it right. Now you know what a turning point is, right? Is that clear enough for you? All right. Now in our Bible reading, we find this, this um, story about this young man who the Bible said had a good life with his father. And he came to his father one day and said, Father, give me the portion that will fall to me to divide your inheritance. Give me my portion. And for some reason, I don't know why, but his father did. He gave him the portion. There's a, the firstborn that get the bigger portion. And then every child after that will get a portion of their father's inher inheritance. And so the, first, the firstborn no doubt got his. And then the younger son got his also. And the Bible said not many days, uh, he said that the, the younger son took all the things that his father gave him. And he went into a far country. And he wasted everything. He went and he had the party life. You know, like young folks, they get away from home. Okay, I'm going to Europe. I'm going to go party. I'm going to go live it up. I'm going to go do it all. That's what he did. He didn't have Europe at that time. So maybe he went into um, or Sidon or one of those places that was the party city at that time. And he went there and he lived it up. He lived everything. He spent all his money and harlots and, and righteous living, the, the, the party life and everything. And then the Bible said, it's amazing how God time and work, doesn't it? As soon as his money ran out, a famine hit the land. As soon as the money ran out, a famine hit the land. And the Bible said, nobody will give to him. Nobody will help him. All the friends he had when the money was flowing, they're all gone. Right? All the women that want to hang around with him while he was giving them the, the money freely, you know. All the gold, they were getting the gold, and it says all the glitters, is, <laughs> right? All the, the fancy thing was there, and everything, and the girls were, were lavishing themselves on him, and now everything was gone. They don't want anything to do with him. And he found himself in need and want, and, and all he could do is go. And join himself to one of the citizens of the country. And the Bible said the man sent him into his pig farm, his pig field or whatever, pig farm, whatever, to go feed my pigs. That's all I can do for you. Go feed my pigs. It was a man that had everything. He had good living at home, servants. A father that loved him, a brother and, and family and everything. But because of his bad decision that he made, the Bible said he lost everything. 
And he would have fain or happily would have eaten the food that the pigs were eating because he was so hungry. But the scripture said in verse 17, he said, And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? You see, something began to awaken in this man. It was a turning point. I'm preaching about a turning point. Something happened. He looked at himself and said, my goodness, what am I doing to myself? My father's house have servants that are eating better than I am. They're living a better life than I am. I have a father. I have my father's rich and wealthy. And here I am feeding pigs and will happily eat pig food. And something began to happen in his mind. He began to remember how good he had it at home. How good his father was to him. How good his family was to him. And the Bible said he began to question his own situation. You see, you can't change until you look at your circumstances, you look at your situation and say, what in the world am I doing? Why am I living like this when I know God, my heavenly father, have a better life for me? Right? Why am I living like this when I know God can give me a better life? Why am I doing these kind of things when I know that God expects better of me and God will give me better and God will provide a better life for me? Why am I living such a life? And so the Bible said he came to himself, he came to that awakening moment in his life saying, I will arise and I will go to my father's house. He came to himself. You see, a turning point was needed in this man's life. In order for him to get out of that situation, he needed something something to awaken him and so a lot of times you come to church and God by the Holy Ghost began to speak to you what are you doing with your life why are you keep living such a life when God have a better life for you didn't Jesus say that to us he said I am come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly he said a thief cometh not but for to steal to kill and to destroy he said I am come that you may enjoy living your life it is not the will of God for us to have a, 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 a rough life or for us to live a life that is beaten down by sin and all these things God wants to give you something better he wants to give you a better life but you have to get to that place uh, that turning point in your life where you say you know what uh, I know what the preacher is saying that's right I know the things that I have done or the things that I'm doing may not be right uh, I will arise and I will go to my heavenly father because Jesus died on the cross of my sins uh, and Jesus rose again from the dead and he is ready and willing to forgive me and to bring me into his family and to give me a better life. I'm thankful this morning that God accepts sinners. He accepts anyone that will come to him. But we have to get to the place. Salvation is not all about God. God already did his part. He already sent his only begotten son to die. He already raised him from the dead. Now it's up to us to do our part. It's up to us to come to that turning point in our life. And come to Jesus and accept the life that he has for us. You see, the Bible spoke about them in the Old Testament. He said they have made lies their refuge. People love lies. I don't know why. I'm not talking about telling lies. Now, if you're telling lies, you're, <laughs> you know, that's between you and God. I'm talking about people love to live a lie. People know what is right, but they embrace the lie so much. They love it. Because it makes them feel good. And the Bible said it will be that way in the last days. He said in the last days, uh, they will turn away their ears from the truth. They don't want to hear a preacher stand up and tell them the truth. And he said they will heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, saying prophesy to us smooth things. Tell us things that makes us feel good, preacher. Tell us how we can do this and how we can continue our life in sin and that God doesn't care and God doesn't, God will overlook this and we're under grace and, and all these things. But the Bible still asks the question. He said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And so we have to understand that we have to come to that place in our life, that turning point, just like this young man. Shall I continue in this mess? 
<laughs> should I stay here in this pig pen, living among the pigs, or should I get up and go to my father? Should I get up and go to my father's house? And that's what the spiritual implication is this morning. Should I continue in the way that I'm living if I'm not happy with the life that I'm living, if I'm not happy with the way things are going in my life? Or should I get up and say, Jesus, I will come to you. I know you can help me, Lord. I know you can change me, Jesus. I know you can take me right where I I am and you can give me a better life and that's what I'm preaching about this morning that turning point have to occur somewhere in our heart and our life we have to come to that conclusion I can do better with God's help amen, amen? he had a turning point in his life he had a turning point uh, the Bible said behold in first John chapter 3 verse 1 he said behold what manner of love the father had bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. God doesn't want us to be called a sinner. Jesus died to make us a son of God, right? He said in Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You see, we can have a turning point in our life also. All we have to do is arise and come to God. And I'm preaching about a turning point in every aspect of our life, not just the aspect of sin. Sin is the first thing I always deal with because I don't want to miss this. See, I preach every time like I'm preaching my last message. So this, if this is my last message God allowed me to preach, I want you to know how to get to heaven. Amen. 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 I want you to know how to get to heaven. You say, preach, I'm tired of you preaching about these kind of things, sins. Jesus preached about sin. <laughs> Paul preached about sin. Amen. Amen. And so if I croak tonight or today, if I fall over, boom, I want to stand before God and say, God, I told them. Yes. Right? Amen. And so for us to really get out of the sin in business, there has to be a turning point. But what about the other aspects of your life? What about other things that uh, you and God knows about, right? I don't need to point my finger there. I'll just preach it and, in a general sense, and you can say, you know what? I really need to change this in my life. God's been dealing with this, with me about this. Like, say, it can be something mentally. It can be the way you're thinking. Maybe, maybe you brought up one way with a certain way of thinking. God can change that. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're thinking, you know, I will never do anything in life. I will never be anything in life. I can never change this. Uh, I was born this way. My whole family this way. Hey, the Bible says when you get saved, God put the mind of Christ in you. He will change your mindset and cause you to think a little bit different. And maybe you're dealing with that. Maybe your, your mentality needs some help. Maybe, maybe you need some help in your spirit. Maybe there needs to be a turning point uh, in your spirit uh, that, that you allow the devil to beat you up every single day and bring you down. Don't you know that you're more than a conqueror in Christ? Yes. Don't you know that God died for you and he said, If Christ justify you, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? And maybe that needs to be a turning point in your life where you can claim the victory in Christ. Maybe your turning point can be like I shared earlier, maybe financially. You probably need to get your financial life in order. Amen. Maybe it can be something uh, physically. Maybe you need to lose some weight. <laughs> I shouldn't go there, right? Huh? <laughs> I shouldn't go. That slipped out. <laughs> maybe for your health-wise, maybe you need to do some exercise. And whatever that turning point is in your life, that you need to get to that place, right? Maybe for, us, for you to change physically, spiritually, mentally, financially, socially, whatever it is. Maybe you're just, uh, maybe you say, I don't have any friends. The Bible says he that have friends will show himself friendly, right? Maybe if you reach out and shake somebody's hand, maybe they'll be more friendly to you. Right? Christianity is all, is everything. It, encomp it, 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 com it whatever. It covers our whole body, <laughs> right? Our whole being. Body, soul, and spirit in Christ. And so the message is we have to get to that place in our life where we get to that turning point. God, I want to change this. I want to change this in my life. I want to change that in my life. And God will help us. God will help us. This man had a, a turning point, a change in everything. He had a change in his lifestyle. He got up and he went to his father and he had a better life. And he had a turn, ch ch turning point in his attitude or in his faith, his faith also. The young man realized that his action had far-reaching consequences beyond this earth. He not only sinned against his father by 
misusing what his father gave him, but he said, I've sinned against heaven also. And so his faith, he realized that he was in a situation not because God didn't love him or care about him, but he understood it was because of his own doing that placed him there. And so his faith began to, to, to rise up in him. He said, I will arise. I will arise. He came to himself. He said, I will arise. And I will go to my father. And I will say, I've sinned against you. And I sinned against heaven. Right? And so his faith, uh, he had a turning point in his faith. And then the last thing is, he had a, a turning point in his attitude. I'm speaking this up because I'm feeling a little bit weak right now. <laughs> but, but, um, but, but he had a turning point in his attitude also. And so sometimes that's what we need to change. We need a turning point in our life. We need a turning point in our faith. And we need a turning point in our attitude. You see, attitude is a little thing, but it makes a big difference. And what I mean by that is he said he went out. When he went out, he went out all proud and arrogant. And, and I'm going to conquer the world. And realizing that out there, it's not as easy as it was with mom and dad taking care of him. And so he find out how tough life really was and how, how cruel people are <laughs> that don't know God. And so he went out there. And he was beaten down and broken. And then he come to the place in his life where his attitude began to change. The Bible said, he, he said, I'm going to go to my father. And I'm going to say, I'm not even worthy to be called your son. His attitude changed. His attitude changed. He said, just make me one of your servants. And see, that's the turning point, right? When we get to the place and say, God, you know, I've been dealing with this so long. I've been income I've been trying to deal with this for so long, Lord Jesus. I've been trying to fix this thing in my own ability, my own strength. But it's not until we really humble ourselves that we have a change in our attitude. Lord Jesus, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to humble myself before you. And I'm going to give it to God. And let God help me do this. Right? He had a turning point in his attitude. I'm not worthy to be called thy son. He went out full of pride, but came back humble. This was a true turning point in his life when he began to humble himself and realize that he was in desperate need of some help. I'm going to suck up my pride and go to my father and ask him for some help. And the Bible said he did so. He humbled himself before his father and his father, the Bible said, reached out to him and loved him, brought him in, put a coat on him, put a ring on his finger and made a celebration for him because he came to God humility. You see, the Bible tells us this in Psalms 51, 17. He said, a sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. In James 4, 10 said, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. A turning point in our attitude will make all the difference in the world. When this young man humbled himself and went back to his father's house, he was received with open arms. You see, a turning point in our life is needed. And when we decide to arise and make that change, we will never regret. And so this morning I'm preaching about a turning point. A turning point in whatever aspect in your life. If you're not saved, both for us here in the house of the Lord and those of you who join us in life, if you're not saved, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't fully and genuinely repented of your sins, a, a turning point is needed. You need to, you need to do that need to do that and if there are things you're dealing with in your life as a Christian whatever it may be I may not have even touched on anything that you're dealing with but God knows and you knows and you know and so the only way you will change that in your life is you come to that turning point and say God I'm ready for a change I'm ready for a change and you come and pray and seek the help of the Lord and God will help you now the altar is open as you begin to play that's all bow our heads and close our eyes in reverence to the Lord this morning. Father, I preach your word this morning that a turning point is needed. In all of our lives, a turning point is needed. Now, Lord God, take your word and speak to us. Draw us to you this morning. That we will come and make that change that is necessary. Whatever that change that is needed this morning, God, I pray that whosoever will come to you, let him come and receive you this morning. And give them, O oh God, by your spirit, the help to make that change. Bless and accomplish your will now, I pray, as we all look to you in prayer. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's all find a place to pray this morning. You to Johnson line, spend some time in prayer. Make that change that God wants you to make. Let this morning be a turning point in your life. 
Change is possible. Change is possible with God's help. But we got to get to that place, that turning point in our life. Unless we are at that place, God can't help us. God can't change us if we don't want to change. God can't help us if we don't want him to help us. So the message is a turning point. This man, when he got to that place in his life where he was ready, everything fall right in place. And so it is this morning when we get to that place in God. Don't put it off forever, because God will not deal with you forever. He said, in the day that you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. When God speaks to you, through the Bible reading, the preaching, whatever it is, that's when he wants us to respond. Right? It's just like you. You talk to somebody, you want him to respond right then and there. If you don't, you start, hey, I'm talking to you, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Hello? 
Can you answer me? <laughs> because you want them to respond when you're speaking to them. And so, so God is speaking to us this morning. God wants us to respond to him. Yes, Lord. I will do thy will. God bless you. Thank you all for joining us in line this morning, each and every one of you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. And we'll be here tonight at 6.30. Come and join us. Let's worship God one more time, right? Don't worry about me. I'll be fine. God will help me. God bless you. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this service. We give thanks and praise to you. And we ask God you continue to bless and keep your hand upon each and every one of us. Bring us back at the appointed time. In Jesus' name.